Thank you, Don. And it sounds like my voice is being heard. If you are interested in moving up a little closer, those in the back, to see some of the uh, captions here on my PowerPoint, feel free, no one will notice. You can kind of slither and slink up and uh, do that. I am so thankful for the support. My wife and I appreciate so much the prayer and support of Bayside. We are so excited to be in a church that sings the praises of God with classic hymns. I mean, how great it is to be singing and studying the Word of God. We just give thanks for you. And apologetics is in the news. We're going to be talking about the Christological center, the hub of apologetics during the message today. I'm going to be focusing on Christ, the center of our faith, because he is the ultimate wise man. He's the ultimate Einstein. He's the ultimate super philosopher. But more than that, he is not just a philosopher who knows stuff. He is the savior. He is the king. He is the God who became man for your sake and for mine and, and entered into our experience and does a dazzling array of ministries that we sometimes almost, we, we can't sort them out. They're so numerous, but they're, each of them are, are powerful, they're important, and we're going to work our way through seven points of his greatness, of his glory, of his deity, of his ministry to us as the wise man. W-I-S-E-M-A-N, each of those letters means something. So that's your little acrostic, okay? That's your, like NASA, right? National Aeronautics Space Administration. Each letter means something. So we're going to be approaching the glory of Christ, the hub of our faith in Christ, but also the hub of apologetics. That's where we're heading in the second hour. The first hour, as I was uh, chatting with Don and, and the ministry team, I said one thing I could do is talk about how apologetics has exploded I use the word exploded advisedly here because it truly is an explosion. It's like I have in 31 years of ministering in the area of apologetics here in Tampa Bay, that's the, the year we moved back from the Dominican Republic to set up the C.S. Lewis Society based at Trinity College of Florida. And in those last 30 plus years, I've seen apologetics of not just science, but history, of philosophy, of the Bible. By the way, apologetics is rooted in the Bible. I hope that doesn't throw you. What? You mean the apologetics is found in the Bible? Yes. This is where apologetics, so you might say, what is apologetics? Thank you for asking. Apologetics is a, is a branch of theology that sets forth a reasonable defense of our faith. So uh, I, this will be on the midterm. Are you ready? This is a memorizable. Okay, this will be like 15 points value. Okay, it's the first question on the midterm. I, I, I say that in my class and the students, of course, I, I want to get this. So those who are nodding off all of a sudden are taking notes. All right, so apologetics is the explanation, excuse me, I knocked out NBC and CNN there, okay, all right, okay, um, it's the explanation and vindication that is standing up, defending the truth, the explanation and vindication of the Christian faith or the Christian worldview against the competitors, against the competing worldviews, all right, does that make sense? Thank you, okay. <laughs> So, yeah. Uh, now, as auditors, you don't have to take the midterm. It's totally optional. Apologetics is the explanation and vindication of the Christian worldview over against the competing worldviews. And that's literally, I got that from Dr. Harold Bloom, fantastic, brilliant, expert uh, professor of apologetics at Dallas Theological Seminary. I never forgot that. And when I teach apologetics, I want students to realize it grows out of the Bible. So the Bible itself is bristling with, it's just ecstatically, energetically throwing out sparks of apologetics truth wherever you look, wherever you probe, wherever, whatever page you, you, you look into, the truth of the Bible is coming at you in a very winsome way. And that's where I think that the main thing I'd like to share is that there's encouragement. 
There's excitement. There's good news, even in the news. How about that? I'll actually say that some one of the slides I'll show you, may, you may actually go, oh! so I'm going to wait for that. I'm going to wait for that. Oh! OK. I'm not trying to set you up, but if you, if you feel like saying, oh! go ahead and express it. People are saying, what, what is he talking about? OK. Apologetics in the news, how evidence of God explodes on page one. Now, the C.S. Lewis Society, of course, was originally founded at Princeton University. We brought it to Florida with the permission of the founders and relaunched it in 1989, basically. It was originally the C.S. Lewis Fellowship, little background history. And when we reconstituted it under the original name on the Princeton campus, uh, we uh, made it a world missions outreach. Uh, based on the truth of the Word of God. And so that is the focus. I'd like us to turn to Romans as we launch into these uh, snippets of news, apologetics news. Let's take a look at Romans. I could take a lot of passages in Acts and read them, but I want to just select two quick passages in Romans to remind us that the evidence of God and His handiwork are written in nature, and they're really written on our hearts as well. So Romans 1, 18 through 20. This is familiar territory for most of us. So I'll be reading here from a modern translation. I hope that's okay. Um, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since, here's the key phrase, what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse." So the dazzling portrayal of God's power and his intellectual giftedness, his prowess, his engineering ability is put in front of us wherever we look in the world. We were able to go, uh, when we were visiting our daughter in Kansas City area, uh, she and her husband, who's actually deployed now, are stationed at an army base, Fort Leavenworth. And uh, we drove up to Omaha, Nebraska to see this amazing zoo. Some of you may have been to this, one of the top ranked zoos in the United States. Anybody been to the Omaha Zoo? It's an amazing uh, opportunity to see God's handiwork. And we just walked into one of probably 20 s sections of the zoo the uh, section that had butterflies from around the world. And I suddenly said, I feel like I'm in heaven. Because as multicolored, dazzling, exotic butterflies were fluttering around me, I truly felt I was transported to the gates of heaven. I have never seen anything like this in my life. And that experience was replicated hour by hour. Literally, ten, every 10 minutes, I was having another, I cannot believe what glorious things God has made. God has designed the world as a big pointing hand pointing to him, the grand creator. And so that's why two of the three items I'm going to share will actually be pointing to things in nature where God has revealed himself. But that's not all. Go to Romans 2. 2, 14 and 15. These are passages that, again, if we were in apologetics class at Trinity College, I would have you memorize uh, this next pair of verses. Uh, verses 14 and 15 of Romans 2. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. 
And we've all been there. We've all done that. Sometimes our consciences says, how could you have done that? How could you have said that? And then the, our conscience turns around 20 minutes later and says, oh, that's better. Yeah, keep it that way. Stay on that straight and narrow. And then, oh my goodness, you stepped off the road again. Back and forth, back and forth. Anybody been there, done that? Of course, we all have. And so that's what this Romans 2, 14 and 15, is referring to, the gift of consciousness, conscience. And we're conscious of the moral law. C.S. Lewis used this constantly. It was his favorite argument. I think it's one of the most brilliant tactics that he developed because it points simultaneously to the God who is behind the moral law, the moral lawgiver, the background, the backdrop of all morality is the pure, holy, righteous one who has never committed a misstep. And we'll talk about how Jesus, that same being, that same person, the, the second person of the triune Godhead has stepped in and even taken our nature. But that God whose reality we see, we now know, secondly, that we need to get reconciled to because we're on the wrong side of the balance sheet. So the argument, the so-called moral argument that Lewis used very frequently simultaneously shows the reality of God and shows our need of being reconciled with that God. It kills two birds with one stone. What a great way to set up a conversation about Christ. So the um, approach uh, that C.S. Lewis himself used is especially rooted in Romans 2. Now, as we talk about apologetics in the news, I'm going to refer to Three, I could have gone into maybe 10 or 15 items. So I picked what are three the most talked about. Two, I'm going to refer to rather uh, quickly, maybe three minutes each, and then another while well, going to about, no, about 10 minutes. And then if we have time, we might take a question or two. But um, let's go ahead and talk about the first headline. And you may have heard about this. That's David Galerenter. Uh, the headline really appeared across the internet starting mid-May, especially in June, July, and August. Yale computer scientist giving up Darwin. May 2nd, 2019, published in the Claremont Review. You may have heard this. I'll give you an example. One of the reactions to this story was when the biographer of John Paul II, the great, late and great pope, rather conservative, the one that you know, was, had been the uh, bishop in uh, Warsaw, uh, Poland, George Weigel, when he saw this review, this 20-page Why I'm Giving Up on Darwin, written by a famous Yale computer scientist, he said, we of the Catholic faith need to notice this breaking point when a major figure in science at a major Ivy League university has said, done, completely gone, no case can be made for Darwin any longer. He said, this is a rare moment, and from now on, we need to include this in our Roman Catholic evangelization campaign. Now, I've got to ask you a question. How often have major figures in the history of Catholicism questioned, questioned Darwin's theory? Never. They made peace with Darwin back around 1900. They said, well, you can go ahead and work in anything you want as long as you don't question the creation of the human soul. Don't, don't, don't encroach on that territory, but you can do anything you want with the body and... You know, they kind of made a compromise. I think it was a very extremely unwise compromise, but that's what they did, the popes and all the bishops. And then the problems occurred, and, and of course, Michael Behe himself, leader in the intelligent design movement, is Roman Catholic, and he was bringing very powerful critiques. We'll get to him later. And so when George Weigel basically saw what happened, he said, boom, major development. I am, I am making uh, steps, taking action to include this development, the breaking down of Darwin's theory in everything we're doing now in evangelizing the world and bringing the Catholic faith to unbelievers and re-evangelizing re our lost members who've been sucked out 
due to Darwin's theory. I think that's interesting. I think that's fascinating and it's noteworthy. Now David Galerinter has made some comments. I actually have a copy and I'd like to uh, give to uh, or email, if I can, to Harley and Don Rice and the, and the leadership a copy of this essay, make it available, maybe you can even post it. Anybody wants to read it. The Claremont, it's a brilliant essay. It shocks you. And this, when this went public, um, here's some of the things. By the way, he is one of the pioneers of all of computer science of the last 30, 40 years. I think he's in his early 60s now. He's uh, Orthodox Jewish. And because of reasons I'll, I'll explain in a minute, people have not attacked him. He has tenure. Okay, of course, that means you cannot be fired. But he's celebrated as a unique, eccentric, hard to predict what he's gonna ever say kind of figure. And so because of that, when he said this, they said, wow, that's a little bit extreme, but you know, you never know what he's gonna say. But he's still highly respected. He said the key for him was carefully reading Stephen Meyer's book. Well, some of you know Stephen Meyer, head of the intelligent design movement, wrote Darwin's Doubt, and that's based on the Cambrian fossils, the Cambrian explosion. And his careful book then produced another book debating Darwin's Doubt. He read those two books, and then he read a book by the uh, rather eccentric, pompous, but very helpful to us, scientist David Berlinski. Some of you heard of David Berlinski. He's a mathematician, philosopher, he's very entertaining. Um, I'll show you a picture of him being interviewed with Meyer and, and David Galerinter here in a moment. So he read Meyer's book, he read the book that came out of that book where Meyer and his colleagues defended their work, and he basically said, few open-minded people will finish it with their faith in Darwin intact. Let me repeat that. Few open-minded people will finish it, that is Meyer's book, with their faith in Darwin intact. Key word, open-minded. See, we had a rare, open-minded Jewish intellectual, lifelong lover of Darwin's theory, worked it in with his Orthodox Judaism somehow, and he said, I feel rather wan and rather uh, wistful and rather sad, but the evidence is clear, it's overwhelming. This theory of Darwin, while beautiful, is no longer tenable for anyone who clearly thinks. The explosions since May regularly are happening. About every two weeks, another person is awakened by this public declaration that Darwin is gone by a major Yale figure. He added at the end of his 18-page essay, this is a landmark book in the history of Darwin's theory and the discussion surrounding it. I'd say we have reached a turning point he said, Stephen Meyer's thoughtful and meticulous book, Darwin's Doubt, convinced me that Darwin has failed. People say, oh, it's because of the religious pressure. It's your Orthodox Judaism. And so he addresses that about two pages in. Uh, he, he makes this comment. I actually won't read the comment. You can read the essay yourself. He says, yeah, people talk about religious fervor. He says the religious fervor is on the Darwin side. He said, those are the ones who are talking with great, you know, you know, veins in their neck, bulging, like, you know, very tense and, and emotional and strident attitudes and, and trying to marginalize people. It's Stephen Meyer and his colleagues in the intelligent design movement who are speaking with calmness and rationality and science, science, science. He said, all the religious fervor is on the other side. It's acting like a new religious system to prop up their beliefs when they don't have any religion left. This is a Yale number one computer science the leader of the last 40 years. I'd say that's headline news. And by the way, his name is Galerinter, so you have to add another syllable in his name that's not there. So if you want, I'll give you a little tutorial on how to pronounce his name later on. Um, there actually was a very interesting interview done by the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. That's Peter Robinson. It was conducted in Florence, Italy, and you'll see uh, Peter Robinson on the left. There's Stephen Meyer. There's David Berlinski, and here on the right is, is, is David Galerinter. You can actually see that. It's about a one-hour interview, very worthwhile to hear. Uh, Berlinski's a, a failing a little bit in his health. He's getting a little bit feeble. 
The other uh, two guys are rather robust in their comments, so I thought I would make you at least aware of this exciting breakthrough. Now, people may say, are they attacking Galeranter? Well, as I said earlier, because of his esteem that he has in the academic world, not only at Yale, but beyond that, he's an expert in the history and ideas of art. He's an expert in about 15 different fields. 15 different fields. He's very restless intellectual. And that's why when he saw the work that Stephen Meyer had done and heard about it, he says, I gotta just dive in. And the result was just life-changing for him. He says, now intelligent design is a theory, I understand it, I'm not buying it, but it is there on the table. It is now in the running as one of the possible answers. So you say, is he an intelligent design proponent? I would say, not yet. Stay tuned. But people are not attacking him because, by the way, he already was attacked in the early 1990s, physically attacked. You may be aware that there was a guy named the Unabomber, a guy living out in the woods who had a PhD from, if I, if I remember, Caltech, and he had hatred for um, cutting edge technology. He became aware a guy at Yale was pushing the development of new computer systems, and he concocted a bomb wrote the name David Galerinter, sent it to his office, and David Galerinter opened that bomb from the Unabomber and it almost blew his hand off. So he was one of those who barely, just barely, with the help of an emergency medical team, survived an attack by the Unabomber. That's why his right hand has a black glove on it. He is a survivor. He already was attacked, and so I think he's given extra deference because of that. Interesting story, is it not? 100% amazing. Headline news. Well, let's move on. Archaeologists find evidence of a Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem as told in the Bible. This is our second headline news. Up in the upper left hand corner, CNN. <gasps> this is where I thought I might hear a couple gasps. <laughs> yeah, how often do you see CNN and as told in the Bible on the same page? Do you see that every day? I, I don't. Maybe you do. No, I, rarely, like if ever. I think this is the first time. I, I, when I saw this, I actually I added this to my PowerPoint. This was not in my PowerPoint, but it, at... Uh, a very early hour this morning, at about 6.45, I saw this page, and I took a picture. I said, I've got to put this in. <laughs> so I took a picture and sent it through you know, electronic channels, and there it is. So what happened? Well, uh, University of uh, North Carolina at Charlotte uh, archaeology team was, was digging in some ash that was related to the conquest of Jerusalem that took place this is the third, not the first, not the second, but the third attack of Nebuchadnezzar, okay? This is the, the, the time when Daniel had already been shipped off to Babylon, and Ezekiel also was there, you know, with the priestly class. They were shipped off to Babylon, and the ruling class, many of them still wealthy, were enjoying life, but living on the edge of disaster. And Nebuchadnezzar came in and finally brought down the sledgehammer and destroyed the city, burned the Solomonic temple to the ground, ripped it apart, and the place, I mean, the whole city of Jerusalem was left in rubble. Smoking ruins rubble. And what they found in a certain level with charred and ashes, charred pieces of, uh, you know, rock, that had the, the, the scarring left that you would expect from buildings that had been badly burned, they found evidences of elegant jewelry, including this particular earring with, and that is a very finely worked cluster of grapes. This is actually one that was picked out of the rubble. So it shows that you had simultaneously the wealthy people enjoying life but at the same time that they were on that edge, as warned, of course, by Jeremiah and Zephaniah. I'm trying to think of uh, Nahum dealing with more of a Nineveh. But some of those Habakkuk, some of those 11th hour prophets had already been warning Judah 
you know, the end is coming. Your sin has brought you the doom, the judgment from God that your sins deserve. And so that is an actual picture that was included in the CNN report, an example of a trinket of those who were flaunting their wealth at the very time that Nebuchadnezzar was about to storm their gates and level their city. Interesting, is it not, that the archaeology field is vindicating again, and I found 20 newspaper headlines just in the last year, 20, about vindication points between what we find in the Bible and what modern archaeology is digging up. This is the most famous of 20. Are you excited? Are you encouraged? I think it's wonderful to see what historical apologetics is bringing us. Well, time is flying. We will be now moving to the third headline. Call this number three, Darwin devolves. Now, you've heard of evolves. Evolves, develops to a higher and higher level. According to Darwin's theory, it's all driven by nature. You know, natural selection is doing its thing. Mutations are involved. The idea of devolves means there's something that's reversing, going downhill over time. It's the opposite of, of evolution, or as the Brits say, evolution. This is devolution. And Michael Behe is the chief teacher, professor, explainer, author, because his book, which came out just in February, is called Darwin Devolves. I read a pre-publication copy right around Christmas time a year ago, and when I finished it, I thought to myself, that is one of the most powerful books on science ever written in the history of the United States. I think it's equal to, if not greater than, his more famous book, Darwin's Black Box. So Michael Behe is unveiling what Darwin's one and only success story is, and this is kind of embarrassing for Darwin. If I were Darwin, I would be ready to pack up my bag and go home. So just a quick review. The cell is a very, very impressive place to visit. If you could shrink yourself down and dive at the micro level, you know, where the nanotechnology is moving and, you know, sometimes you can see machines that are twirling around uh, on a pivot joint at 100,000 RPM, just like a, a finely tuned drill used by, you know, your dentist or by some surgeon to, to get at some part in your body. Well, these cells have extremely horrendously complicated machines and motors that are working day in and day out. One atheist commentator in a recent article said, we see across the cell staggering, that's the word he used, staggering complexity. Well, this was studied, of course, in the earlier book by Michael Behe. I have two titans. We have Charles Darwin on the right and Michael Behe on the left. I thought you might in, in, in be interested in comparing their beards, the structure and motif of their beards, I think is something to be, I think Behe's is rather uh, more uh, elegant and stylish, but that's just my, my uh, personal opinion. But, but Behe, uh, still a professor, uh, tenured thankfully, at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, has really risen to the level of a modern Galileo, that's my personal opinion, but I think many who follow this area would agree that he has had the courage but also he is the gifted seer. That is, he pierces through the fog, the mist of Darwinian theory, and he sees the one or two little places where it does work, and then the 98% of the areas where it does not work, where the smoke and mirrors are now shown to be smoke and mirrors. And so let's just notice what he has been saying and what the new uh, headline news is adding to it. Okay, real quickly. So Behe, in his earlier work, has been using Darwin's own test. This is kind of a quick review of what he's already been saying. He uses Darwin's own test. By the way, that's very clever when you can use your opponent's reasoning process against their main point. And so he basically uses Darwin's statement in the book Origin of Species, which goes like this. 
If it could be demonstrated that a complex organ exists, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Let me repeat that. If it could be demonstrated that a complex organ exists, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Now that comes from chapter six of Darwin's book, Problems with My Theory. Okay, so that's where he, in the midst of an interesting discussion, he follows it up, I said, at the present, I don't know of any such, such case, and he talks about some specifics. We don't have time to go into those areas, but what Behe does, is he talks about simple, very basic mechanisms, like the mouse trap, a rat trap, which has five parts, the platform or the base, which is made up of wood typically. It has the hammer, the U-shaped piece, which does the, the actual business of uh, dealing with the mouse. It has the spring, which is all important. It has the holding bar, which holds the hammer back into place. And of course, the sensitive catch, which acts like the trigger. If you lack any of those five parts, if you lack any one of those five essential parts, how many mice will you catch? Zero. And so uh, you have a machine which has a minimum number of parts. You cannot reduce it further. This is called irreducible complexity. And if this was a class, again, I would say that will be on the midterm. This is a phrase that has been around since 1996. Even the New York Times, when he published this information or this critique of Darwin, praised his work. Yes, I'll repeat that. The New York Times praised his work, said his book Darwin's Black Box was very well written. They didn't ultimately agree with it, but they said it's worthy of being listened to. And then about two years later, they got the memo, you should be blasting his work. And they said, oh, and then they started blasting his work after that. So Michael Behe has been saying all along and giving more and more examples in his, not only his uh, book, Darwin's Black Box, and, but in his subsequent writings, he wrote a second book called The Edge of Evolution, very, very powerful. He's given plenty of examples, uh, one of them that has been suggested by actually an atheist. He said, if I were B, he, I would be talking about the ribosome machine, which is the factory where every single one of your proteins is built. Because it requires a minimum number of 53 proteins and uh, several gigantic if I was uh, um, using modern terminology, I might say ginormous, because they're about 1,500 letters long, RNA molecules. And if you'd lack any one of those 53 proteins or the two ginormous RNA molecules, you cannot produce a single protein for your body. And without proteins, how long would your body live? It would die you would live a matter of maybe an hour or you know, no more than a day, let's say. So this is the most basic machine of all. It is a powerful, dazzling example of irreducible complexity. The cilia, the whip back and forth along your windpipe that enable you to have a clear breathing tube uh, are amazing. They have 200 integrated parts of uh, which all of them are necessary. The, 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 the hairs are, are actually able to move back and forth. If the hairs on my head were moving back and forth, that would be rather odd, wouldn't it? You'd be looking at my head and saying, what's going on up there? But hairs on your, on your windpipe do need to move, and very, very uh, tricky technology enables that to happen. Um, I'm not gonna go through the whole Rube Goldberg, how the water goes down this drain pipe, fills into the beaker, raises the cork level to where the um, little, Needle finally punctures the, the little paper cup filled with beer. The bird becomes inebriated, stumbles and falls off into the spring, propels it to the platform. He thinks the little thread is a, a worm, pulls it, firing cannon K, scaring dog L. And his rapid, as he flips over, his rapid breathing raises and lowers metal piece N and scratches the little mosquito bite. This is called the mosquito bite scratcher mechanism. Okay, it was invented by Rube Goldberg. You may have heard of Rube Goldberg. And this is an example, according to Michael Behe, of how complicated blood clotting is. Because just like you have step after step after step after step, blood clotting requires 20 different steps 
to get from the initial sensitizing step that there's oxygen in the area to the place where the blood is actually formed into a clot. And I'll just show you that the flagellum is the ultimate master example of irreducible complexity. Well, in his third book, and with this I conclude, he's pointed out that the bombshell discovery, and this is the uh, thesis of his book, is that all the things that we see in nature that are happening, such as the development of cichlid fish, which is touted as an example of evolution, or if I go back and show you polar bears or the development of bird beaks, all of these are produced by the breaking of genes. In other words, the only genetic changes that are happening are where genes are worn out, cut into, damaged, are basically degraded. That, and only that, is where Darwinian theory is making micro changes. Are you impressed? I'm not impressed at all. In 350 pages, he catalogs dozens of examples where the scientists say, we see evolution. But then when he zeroes in on the examples, he shows you the only evolution is that something is now broken. And the bless its heart, the animal develops some new little niche to live in where it's all protected with its lesser than full complement of DNA files. Nothing new is being created. Something has been lost. And so we would conclude by saying, Darwin's theory is come to its end of its rope. We have converging evidence. Besides, besides matter and energy, there's information. And John 1 tells us where information comes from. It's the Logos. It's Christ himself. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are manifesting the greatness and the glory of Christ the Creator. As we see in not only DNA, we see in fossils, we see even archaeological discoveries. And we even see on the pages of CNN, um, network news, that you are real and evidence for you and for your handiwork and for your word is exploding in the public. Lord, encourage us, uh, encourage us as we share this information with others. Use it as an on-ramp. Use it as a bridge. Use it as a sharing point so that we might bring the good news of Christ who died for us and rose again. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Uh, tell us about uh, Reboot Tampa okay. Bay and okay. Illuminate Tampa Bay that's upcoming. Okay. That's all you'd like to know about. So that. we are blessed to have a new relationship, a very working uh, close partnership with RZIM, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. And although Ravi himself is busy in some international ministry in January and February, we have <clears throat> the second Saturday of January, January 11th, we have a, a team of, I believe it's now seven uh, people coming in, some from England, some from around the United States, to Bay Hope Church in North Tampa to minister to 600 teens. The, me the message of Christ and apologetics to equip them to live as radically obedient, trusting, transformed teenagers, ages 12 through 18. And this is called Reboot. It's a, it's a branded, a proven, one day, you know, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. program. And we are basically um, hosting it. RZIM, the Ravi Zacharias team, is coming in to do that on that one day. That's for teens. We need prayer. And if you could just uh, put the word out to any teens you may know. Uh, we need maybe some people to help out as, as adult assistants. If you're interested, see me. And then on February 2nd through the 8th, that's a, that's a month later, we're actually bringing uh, eight speakers, and I'm the ninth, we're bringing eight Ravi Zacharias speakers, again, from uh, overseas and the U.S. mainly. Some of their top speakers are coming in to minister to 35 secular locations across Tampa Bay. Some of them will be open to the public if you wanted to come to these secular locations to minister the gospel, the message of Christ, uh, using uh, questions that people have. There's a, a broad range of questions. But if you go to our website, apologetics.org, and that's called, the second one is called Illuminate the Bay. 
You can also go to the website called illuminatethebay.com, illuminatethebay.com, okay? Does that help? Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to share that. So thank you. God bless you.